Good evening and welcome to the September Volunteer Forum. We're coming to you tonight live from Hopper's Crossing, Hopper's Crossing Fire Station uh, here in District 14. As always, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the Aboriginal lands to which we meet 
and celebrate and come to you tonight with the uh, volunteer forum and show my respect to Aboriginal elders past and present and recognise and acknowledge uh, the elders of the Wathaurong uh, people of the Kulin Nation and I extend that uh, respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander uh, people that are watching us uh, this evening. Well, a jam-packed agenda as usual. And uh, as I said, we are coming to you from Hoppers Crossing Fire Station. Uh, one, of the thing that, uh, one of the things that we have done this evening, I know a lot of you get a kick out of when the tones drop in the middle of one of my forums, uh, but being Hoppers Crossing, uh, the likelihood of that occurring is almost certain. So uh, I'm sorry we have disconnected the tones this evening, uh, so we won't be disrupted. So uh, if anyone was sort of sitting there hoping, uh, I'm afraid that won't be happening uh, tonight. Lots, uh, lots on the agenda this evening, a jam-packed uh, agenda. We have a panel with us this evening and I'd like to uh, say a warm welcome and acknowledge uh, Peter Haberstadt, the First Lieutenant of Hoppers Crossing. Thank Thanks you, Chief. Peter. Thank you, Chief. Along. Pleasure and welcome. I, I know Dimmer, the captain, is off on holidays at the moment and he's uh, dutifully delegated to yourself. Um, so, Dimmer, if you're watching, um, Peter, thanks you. That's fine. Uh, thank you. Commander Alex Batty uh, for Mount Cottrell Group here in District 14. Welcome. Thank you, Chief. Uh, always a pleasure to have you on board. Peter Burry, no stranger to the Volunteer Forum, Group Officer for Diamond Valley Whittlesea Group. Chief. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. I, uh, I'm sure you've got a lot in store for us uh, this evening for what, uh, for what we've got to talk about. Uh, leading firefighter Charles Pearce, thank you for coming along. A driving instructor thank extraordinaire, you, and uh, I know you've got a lot of information uh, to impart for us this evening about what's going on. And we've also got Deputy Chief Officer Gary Cook, uh, our uh, DCO for Response and Coordination, and he's out the back talking to the gang from Trugger and Niner, and we've got Steve Organ uh, who's here with the rehab unit. And we're going to see and hear from them a little later, but. Let's see what's coming up on tonight's show. So as you can see, a jam-packed agenda this evening. As always, uh, free to, feel free to ask us questions. Uh, we won't have a live audience this evening, and that's because uh, we're going to do uh, quite, a, quite a lot of things and cover a lot of uh, material this evening. Uh, so please, if you want to ask a question tonight, put it in the chat there on YouTube. Uh, our friendly staff from CFA are standing by to answer any of your questions. Uh, and uh, thank you very much to those uh, from CFA uh, that have joined us tonight to uh, answer the questions of our volunteers. As usual, tell us where you're watching from. Well, I'm always very interested to see uh, where our volunteers are watching from and what you're doing whilst you're watching the volunteer forum. And it's always great to have uh, all our members uh, come and watch the forum from, not only from within Victoria, but right, right across Australia and including across the globe. Well, many of you have been asking for a while of me, when are we going to make pumpers, Chief? Uh, we, we, we've got a, an ageing pumper fleet and we need some more, more pumpers to uh, not only assist with a growing and expanding uh, urban risk across many of our brigade areas across the state. Uh, so Danny Jones is joining us tonight uh, with a big announcement around our pumper fleet. Over to you, Dan. Thanks, Chief, and good evening all. Over the past few years, we have prioritised our capital budget to build crew cab tankers, which has helped reduce one of our biggest risks of having crew members travel on the back of an appliance. Over the past 10 years, we have introduced more than 400 crew cab tankers, but there's still a little way to go before we phase out all single cab tankers that operate with a crew of five. Unfortunately, this has meant that our pump or replacement program was put on hold a few years ago. But I am pleased to say that we're now in a position to recommence a pump or build program and advise that the board has recently approved a contract and we have issued an order for initial 10. I can tell you that the new pumpers will be based on a Scania cab chassis platform 
with two integrated BA seats in the rear and will be fitted with a 4,000 litre per minute Godiva pump. Some other features of the new trucks will include a compressed air foam system for enhanced asset protection, a code 3 variable messaging board, as well as fire medical and road crash rescue support response. It has taken a while to get to this point and I would like to thank the Next Generation Pumper Working Group members for their efforts. Thanks and back to you Chief. Danny, and I uh, noted on the panel here as uh, you went through the specifications there, a couple of nods, and hmm, that's, uh, that's interesting. So uh, I know, Alex, uh, in, in your neck of the woods, uh, well-received announcement, I'm sure. Certainly is. With the urbanisation of the area through here, uh, we need to meet the risk, and these appliances will absolutely mm. do that. Yeah, and, and look, my thanks to not only uh, Danny and the team, but also uh, to all our volunteers that uh, took part in the uh, consultative group that brought together uh, the next generation pumper. Uh, and also my thanks to, to Ross Sullivan and the team uh, who created the original uh, medium pumper on the uh, Scania platform. So a really great asset. And I, I talked to many brigades that really rave about the capacity and capability of those uh, platforms. And I look forward to see them coming off the production line. Well, the, the show today is a little bit like, I know many of our districts across uh, the state will be starting to do their pre-season preparations, which includes uh, briefing our volunteers and brigades and staff about what only the season is looking like, uh, been like this year, but also some of the things that we need to do in readiness uh, for this season. The forum tonight will touch on some of those, uh, some of those elements. We're going to hear about what the season is going to be like. Uh, and we're going to talk about how we need to be preparing for this season, including some of the chief officer and minimum mandatory requirements uh, to be able to be operationally deployed uh, this summer season. The first one of those uh, is the entrapment drill. And we're going to watch a video now from the Tumac Brigade who have gone through and, uh, and, and talked to us about why the entrapment drill is so important to them. And in fact, they've even got, done an entrapment drill as a demonstration uh, to how it can be safely uh, completed in accordance with the Chief Officer's SOP. So let's, uh, let's hear from Tumuk Brigade. Okay, so if we practice it each year, it becomes second nature. We never know when we're going to need it. So when we do need it, hopefully everyone knows exactly what to do. Well, if we understand exactly what we're doing, it should become second nature and you could end up on any truck with any person, different crews. So it'll all just be um, sweet when the day comes that you have to do it. Mayday, mayday, mayday. This is too much tanker. Aerial ID 24 Alpha Lima. Preparing for burnover. We are at 44 Round Road, Pakenham. We have a crew of four. Everyone's okay? Yep. Yep. Yep, all good? Yep. Gonna pass the blankets over. How's the water? Three quarters. Mine's approaching, quick cover up, cover up. Everyone's happy? Yep. All yep. good, all good? Yep. We're nearly through, it's okay. Everyone okay? Yep. yep. All good. Yep, it's okay, it's passed. Well done, everyone's fine, good. Uh, the fire actually came over the front, 
My big thanks to Andrew and the gang there at Tumuk Valley for not only talking to us about the entrapment drill and what it means to them, uh, but going through a demonstration of the entrapment drill uh, for us this evening. Um, Peter, we had a chat early on. I yep. uh, understand that uh, that would look very familiar to you. Absolutely. So, as I had a discussion with uh, with you uh, this evening, that the brigade actually uh, has started its um, pre-season training, and uh, we already participated in the uh, what do you call it, the entrapment drill, um, which we the brigade particip participated uh, last night, which was which was great to see. We had a great uh, great attendance, uh, and I think a couple of things that were sort of, if you don't mind me, sort of touch base on that was. Uh, you know, that the, uh, as we all know, fires are unpredictable. They are very unpredictable. Um, entrapment is, is, is a priority. Um, we need to, 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 to do it according to the SOPs. And look, the key, key points are, look, you know, you go out together, you come home together. And that's what I think what the brigade's been focusing on. Absolutely, no, no true words said, go out together, come back together. Um, Peter, as a, as a group officer, um, I guess, give us your thoughts on, on why it's important that we have an entrapment procedure and why our volunteers uh, and members need to uh, be practising it regularly. Yeah, thanks, Chief. Um, a couple of things as a GO. Number one, our crews can end up on any appliance and working with other crews at any time. So having a consistent approach means that irrespective of who they're working with or the appliance that they're on, uh, means that we know they're going to use the same protocols uh, if, in fact, they, they need it. So consistency is important, uh, interoperability is important, uh, and knowing that we've got crews out working to the same standard of safety uh, is absolutely critical. Absolutely. Um, and because it is, you know, it is you know, like uh, Neighbourhood Safer Places has been the last place of resort for our communities, um, having that entrapment drill there, having the crew protection sprays really is the last place of last resort for, for our firefighters if they find themselves in a situation uh, that, you know, that they are going to get entrapped or overrun. But having said that, uh, I probably the, in preference would be not to probably be there in the first place. So safe person approach, dynamic risk assessment is really important uh, and all crews uh, are responsible for looking out for fire ground safety. And if they see something that's not quite right that the, uh, the crew leader may not have seen or the strike team leader may not have seen, uh, SPADRA is important for everybody and it's everybody's responsibility. So if you see something you're not sure of, uh, bring it to the attention of your crew leader uh, because the earlier you can prepare it and be out of the way, mm. the better off your crew will be. Absolutely. And, and recognising the early signs of when you might become entrapped really is the difference, isn't it? So um, yeah, whether it be working away from the fire line, all of a sudden you start seeing spot fires popping up around you, uh, that ember attack uh, is probably a good sign that, uh, well, it's a bad sign, but a, a good indication uh, that the fire front is rapidly, uh, rapidly uh, uh, coming up on you. Because another misconception is sometimes that a fire front is a wall of flame, uh, when what we know it is, a, it, you know, it's, it's ember attack and it's, a, it's fire spotting upon itself uh, and if you're caught in that, then, um, then yeah, it'll be a bit of a challenge. A couple of questions. Uh, Stephen Robinson uh, has asked for a bit of a clarity uh, on the blankets in the cab. The SOP states to have them ready in case of curtain or window failure. However, the videos on Learning Hub uh, show the crew getting under the blankets. This, show, this video also showed the crew getting under the blankets. Alex, your thoughts? Uh, I think it's important to have them ready, but I think if you're in a position where you can actually get under the blankets, that offers you a, a, an extra layer of protection. I guess the key point there is that people ha need to have a level of awareness about what's going on outside. So if you can do it, then, then that's great, but have that level of awareness mm. so you can check to see that what's happening with the fire yeah. outside. And likewise, if possible, sort of getting below um, the, the window line as that's well, right. if, if that's possible. Also adds that added layer of protection uh, as well. It's certainly a, a great question. So thanks, thanks for asking and thanks for clarifying. And I think when you, are, when you do find yourself in that situation, it's really about doing whatever you can, uh, isn't it, to, to protect yourself uh, from that direct flame impingement, but also protect your airways uh, and look after your crew, because that's, yeah, that's, that's really what it's about, isn't it? Looking after, uh, looking after each other. Uh, another uh, question there, uh, Shane, the fashionista uh, amongst us here asking about the jacket I'm wearing and uh, whether it will be available. I am a little bit naughty tonight and wearing the old uh, station wear jacket uh, as opposed to the new work wear and I apologise for that because I left my jacket at home. Uh, but we are actually in the process of designing uh, a few extra items of work wear including a jumper uh, that, will, uh, that will be available uh, to our members. 
um, in addition to the soft cell jacket that, uh, that we're seeing Peter uh, uh, wearing here tonight. Thanks for, for modelling that tonight, Peter. Beautifully you know, modelled. It's mine too. <laughs> Excellent. So uh, thank you very much. All right. Well, moving right along, so we've touched on element number one of the Chief Officer's uh, minimum mandatory requirements, and that's entrapment. Let's talk about trees. Um, and what many people might not know is aside from cardiac issues uh, and, and heart-related um, uh, medical incidents, uh, hazardous trees and tree fall is the second most leading cause of firefighter fatalities on the fire ground, and unfortunately here in Victoria, we've, uh, yeah, we, we've, we've experienced that. And uh, it's really important that we understand uh, hazardous trees, uh, how trees become hazardous, and even importantly, how to identify and mark those hazardous trees. Um, Peter, you're a man around the fire ground. Um, talk to us about hazardous trees. So, how much is a tree weigh? Well, it I'm glad you asked. Trees, uh, if they're over six years old, they can weigh between 400 and 600 mm. uh, tonnes. So big trees weigh a lot. But if you do the CFA uh, learning package on hazardous trees, you'll see it's often the smaller spar trees or pole trees uh, that look innocuous, but in fact can be a hazard on the fire ground. So um, prior to the season, it's always good to brush up on those because it's one of those things that I thought I knew what I was talking about, but in the heat of the hunt do I actually know, particularly given that the markings have changed. So we've got an old marking system that's now uh, a new marking system. Uh, it was replaced by AFAC. And so it's important that everybody on the crew, but certainly crew leaders and strike team leaders, understand what those new marking symbols are um, because they're used right across the country. So you may be a CFA firefighter from Victoria, uh, but in fact you're working in New South Wales or Queensland and having a consistent approach to uh, risk, hazard and how you deal with those hazards on the mm. fire ground is critical because, and particularly this summer, Chief, I, I guess we don't know uh, where we'll find ourselves, but there's uh, a high likelihood it'll be somewhere other than Victoria. So having that consistent approach mm. uh, is, is, is a good part of our safe person approach in SPADRA. Absolutely. So we're seeing some, uh, some pictures here on the screen run through, um, some clearly hazardous trees that we can see there. So talk me through, I guess, how do you start to recognise the signs of a, of a hazardous tree? So what the, uh, the learning program says, uh, it talks about looking up but also looking down. So you're looking up into canopies for unstable canopies, uh, burnt through trunks, uh, areas of, uh, of trees that may have been impacted by fires or could be impacted by fires uh, as part of that, that operational window. And the different types of circle trees, slash trees, cross trees, uh, trees with hangers and indicator trees are a good way of being able to identify those. So everybody on the crew should have familiarity with uh, understanding what type of trees are likely to be a risk and to pass that up the chain to people who are qualified to go out and undertake the assessment and then mark the trees. All right, uh, gentlemen, pop quiz, pop quiz time. So, clear and present danger, protection not assured. What's that look like? Circle. Protection not assured. Circle. Protection not assured. You've got the answer right here. I can't, I can't <laughs> repair to you. Circle with a line, I believe. That's yeah. right. Circle with a cross. Circle with a lot. Yep. Circle with a um, slash tree. Slash tree. Slash yeah. tree. And in the old marking, that otherwise uh, an X. cross would have been a cross. It, was, it would have been a cross. Yeah. Um, you talk about ha hanger, like a hanger, uh, yeah. before. Tell us, tell us a bit, a little bit more about that. So a couple of things with hanger trees, um, and that's the importance of looking up. So you can have hanger trees that have just occurred in nature because mm. uh, the forest was what the forest was. It could have been as a result of the fire coming through, or if you're working around aircraft and you've just had 9,000 litres mm. of water dropped on a fire ground, I can guarantee that uh, the canopy will, will have collapsed and you'll have a lot more hangers than what you thought yeah. you had. Correct, correct. So let's see if we can, uh, if, if the team behind the desk can work their magic, let's see if we can get back to the markings there and we'll, we'll run through them because this is about not only uh, briefing our people to, to the season, but also uh, a bit of a refresher for anyone that may not have done it yet. So. Uh, potential clear and, pres uh, uh, clear and present danger, CPT protection assured, used to be the old dot tree, is now a circle. Right. Now we talk about protection assured, um, what does that mean? 
Well, it means, Chief, that it's got a high probability of surviving the fire, but what it does mean is that it may be impacted by the fire or by wind, so it may still present a danger to crews whilst they're working around the fire line. Yeah. And if you are working in and around that tree, you know, it's probably worth trying to take a few extra steps to uh, you know, maybe raking around it or doing, doing some sort of things to make sure that that assurance is, is, is maintained. So then we move on to the potential CPD protection not assured. So the old cross tree, uh, now the, the slash tree, which is the circle uh, and the, uh, the slash through it. Um, so protection not assured, talk us through that. So uh, I think the difference between this is that it's not likely to survive the time that we're at the firefight, but it may still present a, a clear danger to crews uh, once it's impacted by the fire or by the wind itself as well. Yeah. So when we start seeing that circle with the cross through it, we need to start thinking this, this, uh, this tree, if, particularly if there's been a fire in the area, it, it, it could, be, could be dangerous um, and its protection is not assured. So extra, extra careful. Then we move on to, I guess, what a lot of people still remember, which is the, the K tree, uh, clear and present danger. So that was the old marking, the K. The new marking is a cross tree, circle with a cross uh, through that circle. Uh, and that's as, as it indicates. It is a clear yeah, and present, present danger. danger. Um, yeah, if something happens and, and you're under it, unfortunately, um, yeah, bad things are, are very likely to, uh, to happen. So if you see that marking, um, Peter, what, what should you do? So you can see, an you can see the indicators show an escalating level of risk against mm. those trees. So uh, like a lot of things where there's a risk, it's uh, perhaps the, th the three-step approach, all big ones and all backwards. Uh, move out of the area. Uh, make sure that you've uh, identified where the tree is, uh, put um, marking tape around it, uh, relay the, the location of that tree back to your uh, crew leader or your strike team leader, mm -hmm. communicate it to other crews who are in the area so it's quite clear that there's a risk uh, of that tree falling uh, during uh, the current operating window and you need to stay clear. Mm. Uh, what about marking the area out? Yeah, so, so I think a key point to make here is that the majority of the trees that people see won't have markings on them. So, so we want people to look up, look down, look around and assess the risk. Conduct that con continuous dynamic risk assessment. If you see something that doesn't look right, if you see something that looks like it might be a clear and potential danger tree, uh, get some tape, whether it's the tree marking tape or, or exclusion tape, and create an exclusion zone. Mm. At least two tree lengths, the size of uh, the tree that you're looking at. So pop quiz, Peter. Uh, can any member make an assessment and determination to whether a tree is protection assured or protection not assured? So the assessment needs to be done by an assessor. Mm. So the, uh, the, the ordinary firefighter, people like uh, myself and others, can certainly identify that there's likely to be a risk. Great starting point uh, as part of that uh, dynamic risk assessment. So point that out to your crew leader and get someone qualified to come out and make that assessment. So the next question that might be asked is, um, you know, if, if there is a dangerous tree, I've, I've informed someone, I might have put a bit of tape around as best as I can to, to really uh, carve off the, the area. What can I do to inform other crews that might be coming along to say, hey, there is a danger here? Peter? So uh, you've got uh, fire ground channels and you can communicate that out to other people in the, uh, in the crew in the strike team and let them know uh, what the location is. The great thing about our radios is uh, you can give uh, good lat longs and so you can give people quite a good um, uh, indication about exactly where it is, mm -hmm. point out the geography, the topography uh, and that'll give them a pretty mm -hmm. good understanding. Uh, and we saw on screen there before the arrows. So it is okay to actually mark another tree that, that, that is okay, uh, but put that arrow uh, with, a, with, a, with an indicator to say, you know, in this instance there we can see clear and present danger um, with an arrow, there's a tree 10 metres in that direction that's, uh, that, that's no good, uh, stay out of the area. Um, and the general rule of thumb, if you do see a tree, it's generally one and a half to two times the height of the tree to ensure that you stay uh, out of that area. So uh, a bit of a bit of a refresher uh, for members that, uh, that want to learn more or you haven't yet to do your hazardous trees, uh, you can find more information and undertake the online training package uh, on members online through the Learning Management Hub and we'll put some more information uh, into the chat. But I hope uh, tonight has been informative as a bit of a, a, a refresher or at least an introduction to what hazardous trees are and how we can identify them, but more importantly, mark them for the safety of our fellow firefighters on the fire ground. 
Well, moving on to another hazard, uh, and this is actually one of the ones that CFA has highlighted, uh, as well as trees, as being one of the uh, biggies uh, in our organisation, and that's driving uh, and safe driving. Uh, and Charles is here with us, so welcome. Uh, that's true. And you're all, man all things driving. Correct. Uh, the Peter Brock of CFA. Um, tell us, why is tanker rollover a major risk in CFA? Well, tanker rollover is a major risk because most of our fleet are tankers, Chief. Mm. So there's a lot of tankers out there and most of our fire calls, we have to drive a tanker there. So um, that's probably one of the big reasons yeah. it's such a high risk and high frequency because mm. there's a lot of tankers out there. And, and uh, I guess more in general in terms of response driving of an emergency service vehicle, yeah. particularly the, the appliances that we have, heavy vehicles, heavy vehicles. driven... Uh, Drilling code one, different um, conditions, different yeah. conditions, and the, yeah. the it, it's an added risk, isn't it? It is. Yep. Yeah. And then then you get off road as well, and mm -hmm. there's more more risks off road as well. That's right. So talk us through, I guess, if you're a if you're a tanker driver, uh, we're, we're we're off the, the bitumen now, we're in the bush. Uh, yep. Talk us through, I guess, some of the risks or some of the hazards that I should be looking out for uh, as I'm I'm driving that tanker. Well, aside from trees falling on the vehicle. Um, Cross slopes and soft edges are, um, have been uh, well documented as causes of uh, cr crashes, incidents with our tanker fleet. So mm -hmm. cross slopes and yeah, the soft edges on tracks. Um, so on tankers, so firefighting fleet, we uh, maximum 15 degree cross slope. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, FCVs and those type of light fleet, uh, 20 degree cross slope. And for uh, the newest member of the fleet, the ultra heavy tanker, we're recommending maximum 10 degree cross mm -hmm. slope, just because it, it's larger size and larger water carrying capacity. Uh, and the fact that they do carry water. And um, the water can move. Yeah, adds that, you know. The, adds an extra absolutely. complexity to, 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 yes. to, the, um, to the driving conditions. Yeah. And um, we've just seen some photos up on, yeah. uh, on the screen there of unfortunately some incidents. Uh, that have a have occurred. Yeah, they do happen. Yeah, and, and it's pretty clear in some of them in terms of whether you know soft edges. Yeah. Um, yep. yeah again, that cross slope, yep. uh, cross slope driving. And the changing cross slope mm. with either uh, pothole or uh, animal holes, um, softer, un, unseen changes in the surface condition mm -hmm. um, can caught, get us unstuck. Mm -hmm. Uh, very quickly. So as a driving instructor, what are some of the more common questions that the students ask you about driving? Um, what, how do we measure cross slope? Mm -hmm. um, and it's just a, a thing of being practicing it, um, getting out into your brigade area, getting to know the territory, the terrain you, you're operating in mostly. Uh, there's apps on your apps on phones that you can use to measure angles and also just relating it to the truck you're going to be driving all the time mm -hmm. that's just simple ways and we do it on the off-road driving training courses mm -hmm. so it's a, one of the main points we emphasize quite regularly mm -hmm. cross slope and what about cornering and cornering as well yeah, yeah. Uh, just the cornering because we're driving vehicles with a, a fluid load um, that load moves a lot uh, so you've got to be careful and also not just a full tank, but when more so when we've got half a tank and less. That's yeah, absolutely. Cornering can be um, quite a lot more difficult mm. with half a load of water in the tank. So, so if if I am a driver, I am driving. Um, I'm doing that, you know, DRA dynamic risk assessment all the time. That's the yeah. main thing. Yeah. Um, what's you know, if in doubt, I guess the answer is slow down. Slow down, because. Yeah better to get there than not get there at all. Absolutely. Um, and in some instances, probably even stop. Yes. You know, uh, yeah. and, and, you know, scout the ground out ahead. Yep. Uh, plan the path. Yep. Uh, and, and, and work your way uh, through. Work so that's, uh, yeah, some really good, um, yes. some really good uh, tips there. Um, so what else, I guess, uh, from a, a driving instructor perspective, you know, to, to our members out there, particularly our, our drivers, yep. um, what message do you have for them this season? is it always take time to assess the, the road conditions, both on the road and off road. And yeah, if in doubt, take it a bit slower, go a bit easier, because it's better to get there 
a little bit later than not get there at all. Absolutely, no, wise, wise words. Um, yeah. Peter, I'm, you know, I'm sure in, in your time you have uh, yeah, taken a strike team away or, or at least dealt with uh, long haul uh, strike teams. Um, what are some considerations from a, from a strike team leader's perspective around driving, uh, managing the risks of, of fatigue and the like? So the drivers have a lot of responsibility because they've got uh, a crew on board. So good drivers will also, will always understand the balance between what they're able to achieve as a driver and safety of the crew and to get that balance right. Uh, as a strike team leader, it's a matter of uh, managing fatigue and understanding uh, how you rest your crews, rotate drivers if you've got the luxury of rotating drivers. But uh, slope approximation really is important because we've seen people get, uh, get enthusiastic for all the right reasons, um, but trying to understand that you might be on a slope that looks OK, but if you've got a great big wombat hole, yeah, uh, that'll change, change, that'll change in an instant. <laughs> yep. uh, particularly uh, if you're still trying to work uh, an active fire line at the yep. same time with crews on the back. So it really is about slowing down a little yeah. uh, and having an understanding okay. that you're not in a car, in a car. No. you're on a bit of machinery and treat it as a bit of machinery with, with humans on it uh, and probably drop it back a cog. Absolutely, yeah. and last thing you want to do is drop a wheel in a wombat hole and uh, all bad, manner of bad things yeah, happen yeah. At, exactly. at, at that point. A bit of a question here, um, you might know the answer. So Jason asks us, any update on the driving policy and legislation course? Uh, if and when will it be available online again? Uh, do we have any insights? I think it's still going through um, consultation. Mm -hmm. um, so then once the consultation's finished, then it'll go to you, Chief, to be signed off. Yep, and through then our governance structure. And yep. through the governance, and um, then it'll be out for everyone to access. No, awesome. Uh, Jeannie asks, uh, there, are, there are no towing trailer course trainers around our area, and while some of us want to enrol on the hub, we can't do it. We tow tra catering trailers and sometimes quick fields. Um, Alex, your experience in, in that regard? Uh, look, I think, you know, if you can't access a, a district-based course, the best thing to do is start doing some familiarisation at the station uh, with the people who know uh, how to, to currently tow the trailer. Uh, doing that enterprise skill set is how we close the gap. Mm. And, uh, and, and, and talking to your district um, CLD uh, or your catchment commander That's right. uh, will also assist in, in trying to find out where the next available course is uh, and what can be done to get you on. So um, thank you for your question there. Well, I think uh, thanks for, for talking about all manner of things uh, driving and rollovers. I think there's some really key messages here tonight. Uh, again, dynamic risk assessment. Yes. Yeah, DRA, DRA, DRA. Uh, if in doubt, yes. slow down. Slow down. Um, it's better to, to, to get there a little slower than, than not get there at all. And, Absolutely. Uh, if that means stopping the vehicle in some circumstances and scouting the path ahead, uh, yep. it is quite often the safest way to do it. So. Thank you for, for coming along and having a All chat right. with us this evening. Uh, well done. Thanks, Chief. Well, we touched on what the season might look like. And uh, in combination and talking to Alan Slipovich and his team, uh, we're actually now going to start doing a monthly weather outlook uh, that will be available to members online where people will be able to get uh, a blow by blow th uh, on 30 day increments on what the weather is doing or has done uh, and what we expect the weather to do in the next 30 days. So tonight we're going to launch uh, the first of those videos and Musa is going to take us through uh, the seasonal outlook. Over to you Musa. G'day, I'm Musa Killink and I work as a fire behaviour analyst. Today we'll be talking about the spring bushfire outlook. The Australian seasonal bushfire outlook for the spring period shows increased risk of fire in the northwest and southeast regions especially in areas largely unaffected by the black summer bushfires. Looking back, rainfall across Victoria over the last three months was generally below average across southern and eastern parts of Victoria. The below average rainfall resulted in below average soil moisture available to plants across southern and eastern parts of Victoria when compared to the historical average for the same period. There is still high levels of stream flows across eastern Victoria that will limit large fire potential. Most of Victoria's grasslands and croplands are in the green phase of curing. There is some isolated yellow phase of curing 
emerging across East Gippsland and parts of the northwest. August is generally a quiet period of the year for grass and scrub incidents. Conditions have been generally similar to last year and have been lower than average compared to the historical record. However, in the southeast, grass and scrub incidents were average when compared to the historical record. Looking forward, there is a higher than average chance that maximum temperatures will be above average. There is also a high chance that the western regions of Victoria will experience unusually warmer conditions. In terms of rainfall, below average conditions are expected across Victoria. Similarly, there is a high chance that the western regions will also experience unusually drier conditions. Our spring climate is likely to be impacted by El Nino, for which the Bureau of Meteorology recently upgraded. The combination of an El Nino and a positive Indian Ocean dipole is likely to increase high weather potential for the spring period. The summary for the spring 2023 outlook is that we are now expecting warmer and drier conditions during spring. This is likely to increase the level of dryness in grass and forest vegetation. As a result, bushfire risk in the east and west of Victoria is likely to increase as we approach the summer period. Thanks, Musa, for, uh, for that update. Very in, uh, informative and certainly something that's been talked about uh, right across the country. Uh, welcome to the panel, uh, Deputy Chief Officer Cook, uh, our Deputy for Response and Coordination. Uh, just heard Moose's outlook there. What are your thoughts? Yeah, look, it's, uh, I mean, all the um, information's lining up that it's a different season than the last three, isn't it? I mean, the conditions are dry in East Gippsland, um, probably an early introduction of a fire danger period in that part of the state. Um, there's patches on the west side of Melbourne, sort of Geelong through Bacchus Marsh up into the Mount Masset and it's dry and obviously up in the Mallee. So, you know, clearly we'll continue to watch that. Um, at the same time, the northeast is actually still quite damp, streams are high. And uh, I've just been looking at the forecast, there's a potential for a reasonably significant rain event coming through next week. The models haven't yet lined up. So, mm. you know, it's spring and we know that weather in spring, you can get storms, you can get heat, you can get wind, you get all of those things. Uh, the important thing for us is that we've got our eye on the ball and we're starting to get ready. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, uh, certainly, yeah, but what we do know in, in terms of that El Nino um, declaration with the combination of the positive in the ocean dipole, we're going to return to the traditional summer. Um, yeah, is, it, is it going to be what we saw in 1920? No. Um, yeah, because yeah, that was preceded by three years of you know, real uh, drought-like conditions. Um, but certainly it's going to be hot. Yeah, in fact, as we saw, almost four times hotter than the median average uh, temperature uh, for, for summer. So back to, I guess, what we haven't had for a couple of years is a, is a, is a traditional summer, yeah? Yeah, and the grasslands and the, the crops and, and then ultimately the stubbles will be heavy, particularly where there's been good rainfall. But we also know that in some areas, um, some of those crops actually might not finish as well as they were originally thought mm. they, or hoped they would. And, that's uh, not good news for some, you know, some of our farmers out there, of course, but you know, there will be varying fuel, states of fuel. But I think you know, the, the heavier fuels, because of the moisture we've had over the last three years, it's not like a 1920 season, no. just be you know, clear about that. But you know, the, we often say you only need one bad day to have had a bad mm. summer, and that's why it's important that we you know, get ourselves ready, do all those things we've been talking about tonight and uh, get ourselves in shape for whatever summer presents. Absolutely, and I know you and I have been keeping a close eye on, on our neighbours to the north, uh, New South Wales, which have, you know, have seen quite a significant number of fires right across the landscape there uh, from the, the Queensland border all the way down to, to the south coast. So it is rapidly drying out. Uh, in fact, uh, this week I was in Canberra with the Chiefs and Commissioners for the High Risk Weather Season Summit uh, put on by uh, the National Emergency Management Agency, NEMA, uh, where we got talking about yeah, the conditions, the outlook, and what it might mean for uh, for Australia this uh, season. Uh, Gary, quick one for you, and an earlier question, uh, and I know this area sits within your portfolio, and we'll just quickly uh, pivot to EV things uh, and lithium ion batteries. Question around when we might see an SOP or some sort of advice and guidance uh, to our firefighters about um, lithium ion batteries. 
Yeah, it's a really interesting space and there's been some, uh, you know, been a couple of these in the last few weeks. Um, we had one out in District 14, uh, you know, a few weeks back. There's been a couple up in the, uh, in New South Wales and um, our SOP is right to the point now where it's ready to move into our broader consultation piece. So I'd say it's about 98% drafted. And uh, the important thing here is that it's a really dynamic space. You know, so the SOP that we produced today could actually end up needing to evolve as well because this is such a dynamic space. Um, for members, if you go onto the members online, there's some really good short burst videos that have been recorded by some of our members just about some of the immediate precautions to look for around electric vehicles. And you know, one of the things that was really apparent to me when I was looking at it is you know, never stand in front or behind an electric vehicle mm -hmm. because they can re-engage, uh, particularly if there's a thermal runaway activity and, and take off and they're silent. So you know, never approach them from the front or behind it. They're just simple little tips, but clearly as we move through and uh, get greater uh, clarity, the SOP will help us. Mm. And if members do want more information about EV cars, in particular the, dip, the varying brands of EV cars, um, there is information available on Members Online. In fact, we've got a, a series of videos uh, that we put together with, uh, with EV Safe uh, on each of the brands. And I encourage anyone that uh, wants to uh, go and have a look at that, uh, search uh, EV vehicles, I think from memory, uh, on Members Online and you'll, you'll find uh, those videos. Uh, another question here I think is worth uh, touching on. Michael asks, why is the daily fire danger rating not being declared yet? Uh, so we will see the fire danger period come into effect for the East, for the East Gippsland and Wellington Shires uh, as of the 9th of October, which is uh, significantly you know, a good number of weeks uh, earlier than what we would traditionally see uh, in any given year. But I know, Gary, um, uh, the Bureau, the Bureau of Meteorology is the one that produces the, uh, the outward facing fire danger ratings on the public website to which the CFA website uh, gets its feed from. Uh, and there's a process we've got to go through, isn't there, to, to, to notify the Bureau of, uh, of when we anticipate the risk to be uh, in the state, because they, they do need a bit of time to, to get ready for that, don't they? Yeah, so that's right, Chief. And uh, we've actually been advised from the Bureau that they'll actually start making that feed available from next Monday. Mm -hmm. So that's the 2nd of October. Uh, probably see the first public facing of that uh, potentially on the Wednesday. So it's... Um, yeah, the, the, those, uh, that was a great question, but we'll see that coming through yeah. shortly. In the northern states, that's already been active, of course, because their season starts earlier, and the Bureau has been uh, producing those um, AFDRS uh, details up in the northern states now for you know, a period of time. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, look out, you'll be seeing the, uh, the AFDRS come alive uh, on the uh, website shortly. Uh, speaking of ADFRS, it's probably opportunistic time to, to just, I guess, recap on the Australian Fire Danger Rating System uh, and some of the ratings and, uh, and some of the, I guess, the uh, messaging that goes along with the various ratings. Um, there's been a change. We've moved from the Fire Danger Rating to the Fire Behaviour Index. Um, Gary, do you just want to talk us through, I guess, why the difference? Well, it's quite complex in terms of what's just behind it. Uh, this is really about um, the old MacArthur models were very much about a weather mm. um, fire forecast behaviour. This is very much about a fuel and weather model. So it considers the fuel types, the dryness and uh, how fires will behave in different fuel types. So it's a, it's a much more complex and sophisticated model. Mm. Uh, it has resulted in a reduction from the six ratings down mm -hmm. to four. And it is also now a national rating system. So it doesn't matter which state of, of uh, Australia you're in, you'll actually mm. see the same fire danger rating. So obviously harmonising that was quite a challenge mm. uh, to get all of the states to, uh, to sign mm -hmm. up into an agreed position. But, you know, the moderate, high, extreme and catastrophic mm. ratings are now there. Um, the catastrophic rating kicks in at a, a fire behaviour index of 100 or above. So it is... You know, it's, it's in the three-digit range, but we're, we're still, you know, running the comparison between the old FBI model and the new FBI model because we know that there are some, some uh, nuances in there yeah. that we will need to adapt and adjust to. But this is clearly the public-facing messaging now, and it's around those four ratings. Yeah, and, and I think the point you made before is really pertinent at the moment around, yeah, the old MacArthur model was based on, yeah, temperature, 
<laughs> relative humidity wind, wind. Um, the, the, the drought factor, uh, and you, you did a calculation. Um, and then there was broad categories of either forest or grass. grass. You know, you only had A or B to pick from. Uh, now the, the Australian Fire Danger Rating System uses all fuel types uh, across uh, Australia and, and the FBI is tailored to those fuel types. And that is why uh, a question I have been asked quite regularly over the last week is, uh, particularly around when we saw the Bureau issue a fire weather warning for catastrophic fire conditions on the south coast of New South Wales. And a lot of people sort of saying to me, well, why didn't we have one uh, here in, in Victoria? And that's because uh, that catastrophic rating was made on uh, a patch of fuel type, uh, particularly uh, grass fuel types uh, in the far south coast of New South Wales that didn't exist uh, in on the Victorian side of the border. So naturally, our rating was different. So whilst um, uh, whilst it wasn't publicly facing, I can say that uh, the rating wasn't catastrophic. And, uh, and that is why uh, the system is, you know, got more science behind it, because it really is looking at what is the fuel that the fire will be burning in and what is the likely behaviour of the fire once it, it, it burns in that fuel uh, on the, you know, looking at the weather conditions that, that are influencing it at the time. Um, it, bringing up the, uh, the ratings yet again, Alex, um, one of the things that we did nationally was, was do a bit of a call to action in terms of what each of the ratings uh, meant uh, and, and the call. So, you know, starting at no rating, which is, you know, pretty much... Business yeah, as usual. Business as usual. You're out of, uh, you're out of the bushfire season. Uh, moderate. Yeah, so we're asking people to plan and prepare, having their plan in place. Mm -hmm. uh, high, so we're asking people to be ready and take action if they're required. Uh, moving into extreme, we're asking people to take action now to protect life and property. And of course, in catastrophic, we're asking people to consider for your survival to leave bushfire risk areas before a fire starts. Absolutely. That is the most safest uh, place to be. And uh, what's really handy is, is as, uh, as Gary touched on, um, each of these ratings and each of these messages is consistent across the country. So uh, you, our crews could be deployed into South Australia on an extreme fire danger day, uh, and they know that the key message to the community is be ready to act. You, know, you, may, you may need to act now to, uh, to, to protect your life uh, and your property. So a uh, bit more work to be done in that space, I think, as we get used to uh, FBI, Gary, um, but certainly I think it's handy to be able to bring about some common language across the country. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, the rating standards is, is a really um, good thing. The other thing we've got is our fire weather districts are very large. So, yep. you know, the, uh, the um, southwest district runs from the South Australian border to just west of Geelong, for example. So, you know, the, the fuel type and, the, and even the, the, the state of the weather and all of those inputs will vary. So, you know, there, there will still be some nuances that, you know, people might not necessarily think that they're in the, in the hot spot. And, mm. and yet the weather district may well have more than 10% hitting that rating, which will actually then determine the rating for the whole weather district. Yeah. So it is, uh, it is important. And I think, you know, you touched on it before, the, the MacArthur stuff was a danger index about fire danger. This is about a fire behaviour index. So substitute the D, put in the V, mm. uh, and that's really what the, the difference is in the model. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think that's, that's really, uh, really important there. So um, great, uh, great conversation there and probably leads into, um, actually, this is what I wanted to touch on. Uh, I actually wanted to acknowledge to, to a lot of people out there, you mentioned fire weather districts. Uh, again, we get arcs quite a lot uh, and a very upfront will acknowledge that particularly uh, on the South Australian border we, we do understand and, and, and also the central weather district um, there is such a, a breadth uh, in the area that it covers uh, and we do acknowledge that there is different weather being experienced at either end of those weather districts and I know Alan and his team are working through with with the Bureau uh, to see yeah. whether we can do something better there but again uh, not something we can do overnight, but I know we're very attuned to the issues being raised by our members uh, to some of the difficulties around, around fire weather districts. Well, that leads nicely into, uh, I guess, we've been talking about public messaging. Um, one, of the, one of the most important things we can do during a fire operations is actually inform our communities uh, what, the, what the fire is doing, uh, and more importantly, what we want them to do uh, in the event of emergency, or it may be what we don't want them to do. So, um, Peter, um, 
Why is community alerts and warnings so important? So it's the second of the state emergency management priorities after looking after ourselves uh, and the public, uh, providing the public with an understanding about what's happening in their patch and what we would like them to do uh, is, is our obligation under the Act. Uh, so in fact, Diamond Creek was out training with, uh, with exactly that on the weekend with some, uh, with some scenarios. And, uh, and I think the good news is that generally if you give good information to good people, you get better results. Absolutely. So we've usually got a lot of information available to us. It's a matter of putting that together uh, in a way that makes sense and gives people the maximum opportunity uh, to take the action required. Uh, it just so happens that we happen to have brought some props oh, along. So look, share with us. Look, you really can't go past uh, a map book. Um, they're, they're invaluable in terms of knowing where you are, understanding where the fire is, the topography, uh, and also what the fire is heading towards. So number one, crew leaders certainly and strike team leaders, map books are invaluable. The second is a compass. Uh, this compass has worked for the last 35 years without a battery uh, and still works really, really, really well. Um, so with a map book and a compass, you can give a very accurate understanding about where you are, where the fire is, and what's in the path of, of the fire. That allows you to then say, for this group of residents in these streets, uh, depending on what the, uh, whether it's an advice um, or, a, or a watch and act, we would like you to do X. So you need to use your discretion, um, but it provides you the opportunity to give good people good information and gives them mm. a, a fighting chance. Absolutely, and uh, certainly uh, thanks for, for, for sharing, I guess, some tips and tricks there. Um, Peter, because it really is important to understand you know, what, what the incident is, so you know, whether it be a fire, uh, where it's heading, the direction it's heading, and, and, and as you say, what, uh, what, uh, what is in the way, and then what do we want people who are in the path of the fire um, to do. Alex, mm. is there a legal obligation on CFA to warn the public? There certainly is. In fact, um, it's one of the requirements for the Chief Officer. And are you sure you didn't get that job, Chief? No. Uh, no, there is. So, so there's a requirement. The Chief Officer has the requirement or a duty to warn the community and that delegation is passed back down to incident controllers. My apologies. We thought we hit the thing out. So uh, hoppers, hoppers, you've got a job. Get on the truck and, uh, and get moving. It, uh, we'll see how we'll go. We'll, go. we'll continue to push through um, whilst, we're, uh, whilst the gang are madly deploying to, uh, to the job. So there is a legal obligation a, for us to, there, to warn uh, the public. There is, yeah. Uh, and that obligation is actually on uh, on myself. There they are, uh, the Hoppers Crossing crew uh, deploying off to their job. I'll just look on SAS here tonight. Uh, they're off to a structure fire, a stove sparking uh, to assist their colleagues down at Werribee. Thanks, crew. Uh, good luck. Safe travels. We've been talking about driving tonight. Uh, and uh, good on the duty crew. So that legal obligation to warn the public, mm. uh, on me as it, Chief Officer, but on, that flows on downhill? It does flow downhill. In fact, there's a delegation and that goes down to incident controllers. So if you're in the front seat and you're the incident controller, you've got a duty to warn the, the community, just like the Chief Officer. Absolutely. Um, so talk us through, Peter, what are some of the considerations um, when starting to form uh, you know, that warning about you know, what should be going through your head at the time? So as, as an incident controller, uh, level one, level two incident controller, there's a number of things that you need to have uh, a methodology uh, to think about. Where is the fire at the moment and where is it likely to be in the next 30 minutes to say uh, two hours in, in increments? Uh, the good news is that a lot of that information can be put in, into aid memoirs. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've got a couple for District 14 that we use and we build those into our thinking and our training and our fire ground practices. So we call them 10 quick questions for developing fires because on a given day, the sorts of things that the crew leader needs to be assessing is the sort of stuff that Alex will be looking for in the DCC, Cookie will be looking for uh, in the SCC um, and we need to keep an eye on. So where is it heading? What, what is it heading towards in terms of community, assets, houses and then start to provide that, that information uh, out to the people involved. Mm -hmm. And there are a couple of levels of warnings, isn't there? So we, we, we start with advice, well, we actually start with community information. Yep. 
Um, and then where do we go from there? So we've got an advice message, uh, we've got watch NAT, and then we've also got emergency warning. Mm. And one of the, each of the levels, as we see on the screen here, um, really does go through what it means. So advice message, there is an incident occurring in your area. Uh, be aware of that uh, and monitor and stay up to date yeah, is really what you're, you're trying to tell uh, the community. Watch and act, as it says. You, know, you watch and be ready to act. An emergency is developing. Um, you need to take action now to protect yourself and others. So would we issue a watch and act for, I guess, letting just people know that there's a fire in the area? No, we wouldn't, Chief. I mean, that would call for an advice message. Uh, if we're issuing a watch and act, we're expecting people to come to some sort of call to action. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so then what would happen if uh, yeah, a fire. Yeah, again, we've got a fire. Um, yeah, it's 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 there. It's developing. Uh, it might be a hectare or two. There's some houses nearby, uh, but we've got ten tankers on scene. Uh, it might be a, a, a blowy, windy day. Does the number of resources on the ground at the time affect the message that you might send? Well, we need to make an assessment about where the fire is heading and what the impact will be. Mm. So if we've got good control over the fire, then we would be comfortable that uh, we're going to get on top of the fire. Then there may be an advice message. But if we're asking for people to, for a call to action, for example, watch an axe, mm. we might be asking them to walk two streets back. Mm. Mm. Or uh, yeah, be prepared to leave uh, or leave now. Um, so there really is a couple of com uh, things there that we need to consider when issuing that warning, isn't there, Gary? I, I was just going to say that, the, and Peter touched on it beautifully before, but that early intelligence and the situation report is so critical because you may have 10 tankers there, but what's the level of confidence that you've got that you're actually going to pull this fire up? When we come back to those FBIs there before, you know, if it's at the lower end and, you know, the, the weather conditions are okay, that might be fine, but it also might be, you know, blowing you know, gale and, you know, 10 tankers is actually not necessarily going to be sufficient to pull the fire up. So the message needs to be absolutely tailored to the situation that's there and situation reporting to allow people that are compiling messages to pump them out to the community in a timely but tailored manner is really important. So the level of confidence of control um, needs to be factored into whatever's being messaged out. Absolutely. So we've talked about warnings. Now let's move into some of our key operational considerations. And again, um, yeah, Gary, I think yeah, you actually started this you know, before I come along in terms of some of the things that we need to be thinking about. Talk us through hit it hard, hit it fast. Yeah, well, I guess you know, the principles here are really about hot day response tables. But, you know, um, and I know there's always this convenience factor of, or inconvenience factor, but it's easier to turn trucks back on that day than actually under respond and then go, geez, I wish we'd have called for an extra five tankers. Mm. So, you know, the make tank is five versus a make tank is 10. Uh, look at the conditions, understand then that early situational awareness. But, you know, we all know that every big fire started from a small fire. Mm -hmm. And if we've got the ability to keep it small and snuff it out, absolutely do it. There is a tendency for us to expect that there's aircraft coming. Mm. And PDD's fine, but if, if you've got the second fire, in that PDD footprint and the aerial resources have already been dispatched or they can't get off the ground because of the prevailing weather conditions. So it's a little bit about hit it hard, water on wheels as I often talk about, um, make sure that you've got enough of that mobilised and give yourself the best chance of keeping that little fire little. Absolutely. Alex, command and control. Establish it early is, is my advice. Mm -hmm. So what should we be thinking? Well, we need to be thinking about, uh, do we have the most appropriate people for the job at hand? Mm -hmm. uh, have we established control? Have we established a static control point where we can actually uh, collect the resources as they're coming in and appropriately task them? Things like that. Mm -hmm. have, have, have I set an objective, for mm -hmm. example? Um, what about communications, comms channels? Yep, so making plan. sure that we put in place our uh, district default comms plan, that we've appropriately sectorised the fire as it uh, continues to grow. And the most important piece is making sure that we actually communicate that out to the people mm. so that we're all on the same page. Um, Peter, facilities and wellbeing. Critical. Uh, depending on the time of day, people may have uh, been working and then their tasks to go out. So fatigue management is critical at all stages. Uh, but cur calling for catering and toilets uh, early in the piece, because they may take a while to, uh, to actually travel uh, to where you need to be and you may 
need to take people off the fire ground to where they're able to park. Mm -hmm. So organise them early. And I guess it's the same with um, the messages from, uh, from Gary and Alex, to get that stuff on the road early. If you've got to turn them back, then so be it. But nobody will criticise you for being conservative, trying to look after your people early on in the piece. Because um, you also don't know how long the job is likely to run, mm -hmm. or indeed if there's another job after it. So looking after people will always pay dividends. And, and Gary, uh, part of your portfolio, um, fire investigation and relief and recovery? Yeah, look, origin and cause of fire is such an important thing. Uh, we've, over the years, have actually both detected patterns of uh, fire ignition and working with uh, the police forensics and arson squad actually ended up uh, charging personnel for fire lighting and things like that so you know scene preservation really really important at the point of origin so um, you know just a critical step we can get our fire investigators there but they won't be there immediately so if we preserve the scene for them it gives us the best chance of collecting the evidence our fire investigators are highly trained super skilled, got a really good toolkit, metal detectors, all sorts of things to help them determine what actually caused the fire, but we need to preserve the scene at the front end of that. So really important that we um, you know, consider fire investigation as part of the overall uh, firefighting strategy. Absolutely. Um, Alex, in the final phrases of uh, key operational considerations here, uh, water and fencing? Uh, really important. It's about being respectful for the communities that we serve. So if we've taken water, let's make a note of where we've taken water and go through the appropriate process to make sure it's reinstated. And if we've cut any fences, make sure we take the immediate action to uh, rectify the fence today and go through the process to make sure that it's rectified for future. Thank you. Some wise words there from uh, uh, from the panel. Well, a bit of excitement here tonight. Uh, we are been talking about all things uh, operational and readiness. Uh, and again, apologies for uh, we thought we'd isolated the uh, the station system here this uh, this evening, but obviously not. But let's look to see what's still coming up on tonight's forum. Hey, uh, thanks. We're back outside here. A little bit of noise because the bells have dropped and uh, we know the crew responded before. But I'm joined with Steve and Linda from the Truck and Iner rehab team. Great to have you here, guys. Thank you. Um, and we'll have a bit of a scoot around the vehicle shortly. But, Steve, just to you initially, uh, how long have we had the uh, the rehab unit at Truck and Iner? So our rehab has been online since uh, Christmas Day last year. So it's been online for about 10 months now. Okay, and 10 months. And how many jobs have you responded to so far? Uh, so far we've done about 14 jobs ranging from grass and scrub right through to structural. Good job and of course last year from a wildfire or, or a bushfire perspective, reasonably quiet summer, we're expecting a different season this year as we've seen there on the, on the lead up and probably uh, getting some good use. Linda I might come to you just quickly, what's the, what's the benefits for our members about having rehab units dispatched to the fires? Look, the main benefit is that we get to have a chance to look after them, um, give them a chance to rest, recuperate, check on them, make sure that you know they're coping well in those fire grounds uh, environment, um, and get them back out onto the fire ground. So give them a chance to rest, um, have a chat with us, and then send them back out to do their job again. Now I will let in. You're a, a you know a, a, a nurse, uh, you know an expert in this field, and so have a lot of skills to offer, but what have you seen? What are some of the, you know, in those jobs that you've rolled out to, the 14 jobs? Mm -hmm. Give us a bit of an example of where the benefits of being at a rehab, at a fire, can help. We've had some um, circumstances where we've picked up people that have been dehydrated, um, that have really been quite exhausted, and we've managed to sort of um, look after them, rehydrate them, give them some fluids and electrolytes, and actually, um, you know, make sure that they're not getting any worse and actually preventing them from collapsing out on the fire ground. Um, we've picked up people with some high blood pressure um, and we've been able to refer them to their GP and things afterwards to get that looked at so that for the big fire season, they're actually going to be fit and healthy to come out. Yeah, that's great. And look, at the end of the day, you know, our member safety is such a, you know, it's our number one value. 
we put safety first and this is just another way that we can do that and you know not all of us know exactly what's going on and you get to the fire ground and having the rehab team there to be able to assist and do some of that monitoring mm -hmm. that's fantastic mm -hmm. what we might do is have a bit of a bit of a scoot around the vehicle if that's all right and talk us through some of the features so Steve I might go to you uh, yeah, little cab chassis uh, how many crew can be on board and how many do you normally have with your team yep so our uh, <laughs> chassis is a four and a half ton cab chassis it's able to take four crew uh, ideally we want to take as many ARPA registered members as we can that we have in our brigade. Um, ideally we are rolling with four, however two to three is generally our ideal mix. Um, and the way we've set it our, our appliance up is, well on the near side is more of our go-to side, our initial response, whereas our back and our sides are more of our top up, our um, second line of response, our generators, our bits and pieces that we don't need straight away, things that we can take an extra five or ten minutes to set up and get ready. Excellent. So, Linda, I might come in here and you step me through what's uh, what's in this locker space here at the moment. Okay. This locker space is what we're calling our bit of our resupply. So, um, if we need extra water, it's got rubbish bins, obviously fire blankets. Um, if we get into trouble for any reason, we have um, wet weather jackets so that if uh, any of the fire crew or the rehab members need warmer gear, we've got it. It's things that we will need a little bit later on. We've got a stretcher, um, stretcher blankets, spare batteries, spare chairs everything that you could need to uh, look after our little people. That's terrific. And again, the package, we might move around to the uh, to the rear. Well, but just before we go, mm -hmm. they've got a few of the bits and pieces out here at the moment. So maybe tell us. So this is a typical setup. Um, so when somebody comes off the fire ground or the fire event, they come in, wash their hands to get rid of any um, debris or grot on their fingers so we can get good readings. They sit at our table, we do their monitoring. We do blood pressure, temperature, um, we have a wonderful RAD4 um, device which looks after pulse oximetry, how much carbon monoxide's in your system and your dehydration levels or perfusion index. Um, we document all of that um, and then we sit them into a sort of a rehab space where they just sit and chat and have a bit of a rest for 20 minutes. If all of the um, numbers are good and your blood pressure and everything's fine at the beginning, after 20 minutes you can then either go back to the fire ground or be released as your crew leader lets you do. If the numbers aren't happy, you're a little bit high blood pressure or something, we'll recheck you after 20 minutes. And we often find that that is a lot better. So people have recuperated, they have got better. If we're still concerned, then we might refer them to Ambulance Victoria um, for further checking. Yeah, and that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? I mean, we're looking after our safety and all the signs are there, the, mm. those key indicators saying something's not quite right, then let's actually make sure that we get the appropriate care for our people because that's the most important thing Great. we want for everybody uh, out there. So terrific. Mm -hmm. I'll uh, move around to, um, to the rear and... Perhaps, Steve, you can talk me through a little bit here. Yeah, certainly. So the back here is more of our secondary setup side of things. So we've got our generator, our extension leads, cones, uh, pelican lights. We've also got our uh, awning uh, handles, able to pull out awnings on either side of our rehab appliance. On top of that, we've got some fans uh, if we are set up in a, uh, an area closer to a fire front or something that's got uh, lingering CO levels that we can try and push those away as well. On top of that, we've also got our top-ups for our... Um, cool arm chairs for our neck uh, side of things and some weights and marquee as well that we can get up, uh, set up a little bit further away from the appliance itself. Excellent. And I might just add, this is one of 22 rehab units around the state. Yep. So um, we've got, you know, 22 of these spread around. There are a few pockets, I think, you know, particularly in the west and the northwest where we, uh, we probably don't have as rapid access to rehab units and, and that's certainly something we'll be considering going forward. But... Fantastic. We'll just move around to the other side here and hopefully uh, Lucy can walk around and we don't uh, lose cover. So what have we got on this side? So on this side here we've also got a 100 litre water tank that we use for our cool arm chairs which are probably just outside of uh, vision there. On this side we also have our fridge full and uh, Kool-Aid sticks. Also have a defibrillator and first aid kit as part of our stowage as well. And the remainder of our health equipment and our cool arm chairs at the top here. Yeah, terrific. So the complete package. And what about setup time, Linda? If you get dispatched to uh, to an incident, in terms of out the door, you'll get out when you can, not reasonably quickly. But what's the setup time at an incident? Once we get on scene, we can normally be up and ready to take uh, first members through in about ten minutes, five to ten minutes, which is really quite quick. Yeah, that's terrific. And I was watching your setup here. I mean, the, you know, the setup is really pretty quick, um, and it is, uh, you know, just getting that vital signs gear out, as I would call it, and all of those things which are which are really important to look after our members. So, that's terrific. Um, now, you were just 
letting in a bit of a circuit there before, Lindy. You were around the brigade initially, mm-hmm. um, helping out and all those things, and then obviously the the journey towards the rehab and the skills that you've got. Now you're a you know fully fledged member. Obviously also the secretary of the brigade. But mm-hmm. how have you found that journey? Really quite beneficial. Um, I'd always been around the brigade and knew the all the guys, but it, they just welcomed me and you know using my sort of nursing skills is always a bonus and. I've just found it really beneficial and um, nice to be part of the community. It's a great brigade to be part of and we get to set this up, you know, when people need it. So I've loved it. Can't recommend it enough. Uh, That's terrific. Okay, thanks very much uh, for coming down. So, Linda, really appreciate the uh, the walk around here and all the best for the fire season and the care that you'll be providing to our members uh, right around District 14. Back to you. Thanks, Chief. Thanks, Gary, and thanks to the Truganina crew for bringing your rehab unit uh, and showing us uh, a valuable piece of equipment and a, a just as valuable uh, role that you play on our fire grounds right here in District 14 and the broader northwest region. Well, we've been talking a lot about operations, but something that is just as important and something that I know Natalie and myself have put a lot of effort in, as, long, as well as the CFA board, is uh, making a real difference to the culture within our organisation. Uh, Tonight we're going to hear from Group General Manager Kylie Bates uh, 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 on the culture implementation plan and what we've managed to achieve so far uh, in making the CFA a better place to volunteer and work. Over to you, Kylie. Thanks, Chief. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to be here tonight to provide members with a progress report against our culture review implementation plan. As members will be aware, CFA's review of culture and issues management report was released in June last year. The report made 10 recommendations and a number of sub-recommendations for CFA to improve its culture so that we create a positive and enabling environment for all members. The board accepted all 10 recommendations in full and made a commitment to develop an action plan over the next three to five years. With input from members, the implementation plan was finalised earlier this year. And I really want to say thank you to all those members and VFBV who contributed so positively. CFA executive and senior leadership play a critical role in steering the plan overall. But it is the actions of each of us as members of CFA that ensure that the culture of CFA will change over time. We know we have a lot of work to do and we are only at the beginning, but it is pleasing to see the signs of positive change. The implementation plan contains 137 separate actions to address the report's recommendation. Pleasingly, 90 of those have commenced, 29 already completed and another 46 in progress and on track. Of the remaining 47 actions, the majority are not due to commence until this reporting period or later. Tonight, I want to highlight five specific things that reflect some of the progress we are making. The first is behavioural standards. The standards were finalised and formally adopted last year and have begun to be rolled out and embedded across the organisation. Key among the achievements is that nearly 5,000 members have already participated in a behavioural standards workshops. The workshops have been developed and continue to evolve with feedback from members to ensure that de-identified real life scenarios resonate and are applicable to the experience of brigades. It's important that I applaud and acknowledge the volunteer leaders among you, group officers, brigade captains and BMTs that have recognised that some behaviours are not okay and each have actively sought to have your groups and brigades participate in one of these sessions so that members know the behaviours that are expected of CFA members. The second thing I want to highlight tonight is that we have ensured the volunteer charter is referenced in the CFA policy framework and the standard processes for consultation in the development of new or revised policy statements is clear so that we understand how our policies might reasonably impact the work of volunteers. This ensures that we can work with volunteers to ensure that any challenges are managed, supported or mitigated. 
The third action I'd like to highlight also relates to consultation and engagement with our volunteer members. In conjunction with VFBV, we have reviewed the terms of reference for our joint consultative committees. We have also refreshed the membership of the seven committees to ensure that we have appropriate subject matter expertise from within CFA and wide and diverse representation from across all of the districts among the seven committees. The fourth area of progress that I'd like to highlight this evening is the work that has been done on complaints and issues resolution. As many members may be aware, the culture review highlighted that the experience of many members historically in relation to how complaints were raised and resolved was poor. At the time of the review, CFA was still working through approximately 170 outstanding and long-standing legacy matters. Our leaders and HR business partners have worked hard to improve our processes and this work will continue. In the interest of transparency, a six monthly complaints and issues resolution dashboard is now published to members. By 2022, in June, we had resolved all legacy matters. And in the last 12 months, 70 new matters had been raised through the formal complaints process, with only 29 of those open as at the 30th of June. An anonymous complaints process will also be implemented later this year to support members' ability to speak up and feel safe in doing so, so that complaints can be addressed. The fifth and final area I'd like to highlight this evening is diversity and inclusion. It warranted a recommendation all of its own in the report. We are responding with multiple actions, but key among those is the launch of the diversity and inclusion strategy earlier this year. Lots of our members were involved in the development of this strategy, and there is an entire action plan for all members to contribute to over the next three to five years to ensure that CFA becomes a more diverse, inclusive and welcoming place for all members. We are now able to see diversity data as a result of the Volunteer Recruitment Hub, which will be a key indicator of people being attracted to volunteering with CFA and which will help us to understand if our initiatives are working and any barriers that might remain. So that's just a brief update. It doesn't do justice on all the work that is being done and we will continue to provide updates and actions throughout the progress. For now, I, again, I want to say thank you again to all of those members who are doing what they can to improve CFA's culture so that it is an enriching place for all members. Culture is all of our responsibility. Thanks, Chief. Thanks, Kylie, on that uh, really important update on where, we're on, uh, where we are on the spectrum that is our cultural journey. And I've got to say, isn't it fantastic looking at the photos uh, during that presentation, really highlighting uh, the great people of CFA and the diversity that we have. I'm going to call it out tonight, gentlemen. Uh, we're a little lacking diversity on the panel uh, tonight, uh, but certainly what those, uh, what those photos show us uh, is that we have uh, a great depth and breadth of um, you know, cultures uh, that make up uh, the, the fabric that is uh, that is CFA, so well done. And big thanks and well done uh, to all the brigades who have done your behavioural standards training um, and are starting to really advocate um, yeah, making a difference uh, in our organisation. Back to season preps and ops. Uh, Gary, some of the questions we get asked quite a lot is around uh, school closures during um, during high fire dangers. Do you want to take us through what the Department of Education are doing? Yeah, so the Department of Education have developed their own policy framework now for school closures or processes around high fire danger days and they've effectively got a uh, what they call a, a BAR, B-A-R-R, -R, the acronym for a bushfire at risk register and uh, all of their, uh, whether it's early childhood um, schools, and or other education department facilities all fit into this category. They've rated them all statewide, engaged CSIRO as part of that methodology and effectively have built a model that 
triggers the actions and activities that they will take. And as you can see from that uh, diagram there, if, if we hit catastrophic, everything's off. But the key thing here is the education department have developed it. They're responsible for it. They will take the actions around it. We need to be aware of the fact that that's occurring, but it's actually not our responsibility to do it. They've taken the responsibility on themselves. So just uh, you know, a good heads up. And if you want more information, go to the Department of Education website. It's all on there and uh, you can study it in more detail if you wish to. And I think we've also put in the chat, uh, Gary, some information for on members online if, uh, if you do want to, to know more about what it means uh, and what the advice our brigade should be giving to people if they happen to ask, uh, you know, is the school opening or, 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 uh, or not uh, this season? So thanks for that update. Uh, moving along uh, onto some of the more themes, uh, and I want to talk about Pocket Safety app. Uh, it's CFA safe on your phone. Uh, and I don't know whether many people have known that uh, the Pocket Safety app uh, was launched a time ago that does allow our members to do your CFA safes uh, at the convenience of using your mobile phone. And on the screen here, you'll see uh, uh, um, one of our members uh, starting to, to use and demonstrate uh, the Pocket Safety app. It allows you to report hazards and incidents uh, into CFA Safe uh, in the normal way that you would have done through members online. A convenient and easy way to, uh, to lodge it. Uh, it's important that hazard incidents are reported in a timely manner to enable action to be taken to manage the risks, prevent reoccurrence and to ensure appropriate support to those in need. Take the time to download the app and you can find it in the Google Play Store or in um, your app, what's it called, in uh, iTunes, iTunes on, on the iOS device. Yep. Wherever you get your good apps these days, I guess, uh, uh, what it is. See the guidelines on members online. Um, so a bit of a pop quiz on the panel here. Who's got your uh, pocket safety app downloaded? Please don't tell me I'm the only one. Yes. Oh, excellent. How do you find it? But the phone's off at the moment. <laughs> but actually, it's, it's a key criteria that we've, uh, it's, it's an access that's available to us. So, uh, yeah, take the opportunity to use it. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's good. I've had a bit of a play with it. Um, I can highly recommend it. So, uh, everyone's got a mobile phone today. So, absolutely, uh, I highly recommend it. Mm -hmm. And um, so, fairly prominent in the Hoppers Brigade here, like members downloading and, and using the app? Absolutely, absolutely. There is, there, where there's an opportunity to, to use technology that we've got to our advantage, why not, why not use it? So, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, how important to CFA say as a catchment commander? Uh, so important, Chief, for, for a number of reasons. The first one is uh, we need to check in on the welfare of people, so we need to see how they're doing. Uh, we'll reach out to themselves, we'll reach out to the HSR and, and the brigade captain to talk about the issue. We need to make sure we mitigate the issue. But then the third piece to that is we need to identify if there's any trends that are occurring. So more broadly, uh, we can take action. Awesome. Uh, more information on the uh, Pocket Safe app is available in the, uh, on Members Online, but we've just dropped uh, a link in the chat as well uh, for you to go and uh, find information on the application, how to download it and how to use it. Uh, to the betterment of yeah, your own safety uh, and the safety of the brigade. One of the things I wanted to highlight to, to our membership is the importance of reporting hazards. I think we're pretty good at reporting when something actually happens, like an incident, uh, but it, reporting hazards really does allow us to see trends uh, and to take effective action and control on something before it becomes an incident uh, and, and uh, before people potentially get hurt. So I really do encourage people, download the application um, and, and, and use it if, uh, if you are. Uh, the other thing I would say to you is it's not all about the application as well. You know, the, the, it still remains on members online. Uh, and if you do have internet issues or mobile accessibility issues, uh, you can still continue to phone your local district office. So. Thanks, uh, thanks for the plug there. Um, it, it's, uh, it's great to hear that, uh, that you're to using it. Yeah, not a problem <laughs> at all. Uh, so we're nearing the end of the forum this evening and thanks for, for sticking with us. It has been a bit of a big night tonight. We've uh, talked about a lot, we've discussed a lot. Uh, we've had a bit of activity and a bit of excitement in between. Um, Peter, I've got to say, I don't know whether it's when I come to District 14, but my hands and feet or almost reminding me of a little time that we spent in uh, Diamond Creek Station. It's getting a bit chilly. Not quite as not quite as nippy as Diamond Creek, but uh, but heading in that general direction. Hmm. It, uh, it, uh, it must be something that uh, that the brigades here do to get me out of the station a bit quicker. 
perhaps. Uh, not something I intend commenting on, Chief. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Look, in, uh, in, other, in other items, I just wanted to, to uh, shout out on a few things. Uh, the Young and Members Advisory Committee, an opportunity for, for people to join uh, that group. Uh, we're calling out for expressions of interest. Uh, if you are interested uh, in becoming part of the Young Advisory uh, Group, we're seeking two representatives aged 18, between 18 and 30 years from each district to present ideas informed by the views of young adults uh, across your uh, district and CFA community to share your personal experiences and to create solutions and improve the volunteer experience. And I know uh, Natalie McDonald, our CEO and myself, absolutely love and feel quite invigorated, I've got to say, after we spend a bit of time with our young, uh, our young, um, our young adults advisory committee, um, because it really does remind you uh, what the future of CFA uh, is uh, and what it can be, uh, and, and uh, really gives me some confidence to know that we are in really, really, really safe hands. Well, thank you, everyone. It's been a busy, it's been a busy night. I know there's been plenty of questions in the chat tonight, and my big thanks to uh, the CFA team um, that have been answering those. Uh, and if we haven't gotten to your questions, we'll try and circle back. Uh, but I'm pretty sure a lot of them have been answered. Uh, so thank you for those that have taken the time uh, to ask the questions. Uh, as usual, this uh, forum will be available uh, on YouTube for replay after this evening. And again, a uh, an email will go out tomorrow. Uh, actually sort of um, cutting it up into bits and, and segments, I think is the, is the term used, isn't it, Brad? Uh, that allows our people to actually go back and watch the forum uh, and watch the bits that particularly interest you without, I guess, watching me drone on for about an hour or a bit. Um, so again, encourage people to, uh, to look out for that email tomorrow, share it amongst your, your members in your brigade uh, and start to really sort of share some of the, uh, the knowledge that has been imparted tonight and some of the key safety messages uh, that we've imparted for the coming season. Well, Peter, Alex, Peter, Gary, thank you for coming along. Uh, thank you to the, the, the team in Truganina out there uh, for, for bringing the, the rehab unit along. Uh, thank you to the Hoppers Crossing Brigade. Uh, thank you for um, Charles, our, our uh, driving instructor. Sorry, I had a mental blank for two seconds. Uh, and uh, as always, thank you very much uh, to Beth, Brad, Lucy and Lerner, uh, the team behind the desk that makes the magic happen. Uh, the forum wouldn't be the success that it, that it is without the team. Uh, and you really do uh, pull a great forum together. And I've got to say, uh, when, the, uh, when the tones dropped there, Lucy grabbing that camera and running after the Hoppers crew uh, whilst they got in the truck, good, good, uh, good go. And I'm sure that uh, provided some light entertainment for those watching uh, this evening. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that brings the forum this, uh, this month to a conclusion. Thank you very much again. I uh, wish you a great night and please stay safe.